ever started to do something and then not being quite sure how to stop? With me, it's usually trying to spell the word banana na 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 It's a banana. It's a banana. It, there's a lot of A's and N's and the whole thing kind of gets away from me. Eventually, I just have to put a full stop in there or accept I'm going to pass out. And so this has become a similar kind of exercise with this brief 15 minute video, something that I was supposed to record over maybe a day and get edited and sent out to say, here's what's happening with China and what it means for Ukraine. And instead it's become this now five part series running to more than 14,000 words and 26 pages. And you don't have to have watched the first couple of parts to enjoy this one. It might help, it might not, it's up to you. But as with previous episodes, I'm going to apologise in advance here. I speak no Mandarin. I'm a bloke on the internet and I'm therefore fallible. I have no particular precognition capabilities, although if anybody in the audience does be a dear and just drop the lottery numbers into the chat, I would quite like to retire to a country house with, you know, some sexually curious, nimble young things and a nice cellar filled with decent wine. Otherwise, shut up, sit back and take what I'm giving to you with a pinch of salt. The last two parts were my attempt to try and explain what I think is going on in Xi's China and what it might mean for all of us, whether you're in the UK, the US, Ukraine, Russia, wherever. China is suddenly a presence on the world stage in a way that it simply hasn't been before, like ever. There has never been a point in the several thousand long here history where China has looked this far beyond its own borders with this much confidence. And it doesn't much like what it sees. A world that's dominated by the United States, a capitalist world, a world that in its eyes poses a direct threat to the Chinese Communist Party, to China as a country and the Chinese people. China sees the US as the primary mover in a coalition of states that seek to encircle and throttle off Chinese interests and growth and prevent the justified and inevitable rise of China to become once again the heavenly kingdom. And honestly, they're not far wrong. In the United States, and to some extent its allies like Japan, South Korea, Australia, and indeed NATO, they see China as something of a Frankenstein's monster, a thing that they helped to build in the 1990s and 2000s, but which has turned on them and now seeks their destruction. Uh, to use an analogy, China is a sort of awkward, gothy teenager, fiercely bright but with some worrying habits involving matches, blades and small animals. And the West sees themselves as honest parents, Bible-loving Christians, who these days only occasionally rarely fuck rent boys whilst high on methamphetamine. In short, China does not understand the world and the world does not understand China. According to Milton, to know how a state will behave, we first have to understand what that state wants. And well, we've started, so I'm goddamn well going to finish. Welcome once again then to the China Zone. What the fuck is China, the non-binary state? When I was a young man and I was a courtin', as they absolutely didn't used to say back then, I met a lovely young woman who, for reasons that still aren't entirely clear to me, was prepared to do all manner of exciting things with me involving removing all of her clothes. Being so clearly onto a good, if slightly mysterious thing, I set about ensuring that her clothes would dematerialise as regularly as possible. And this may come as something of a shock to men, and indeed some women, of a certain age, but there are actually only two things that you need to do in order to seduce a woman. Number one, treat her like a human being. Number two, make friends with her cat. If she does not have a cat, make friends with her teddy bears. If she does not have teddy bears, this is a red fucking flag, run the fuck away. Being a teenager at the time, step one was quite impossible for me. I had the social skills of a, land, of a jellyfish on land, and therefore I resolved to progress directly to step two. In this case, the Moggy in question was a fluffy black and white ball of pure evil called Bella with yellow eyes that shone with the light of seven hells. The list of things which drove her to a state of apoplectic anger was a long one. She was an angry cat because her food bowl was sometimes empty. She was an angry cat because her favourite cushion was filled with some filthy human from time to time. She was angry because the dog liked to lie in her favourite basket, or because the dog was minding his own business and sniffing, or because the dog was in front of the cat flap, or because really just dog. All of these gross infractions upon her dignity were met with terrible vengeance involving teeth, claws and ultraviolence. It was then, somewhat to our mutual surprise, that Bella and I got on rather well. She would trot downstairs to come and find me, rub herself against me purring, and then throw herself flat on her back, exposing her luxurious fluffy tummy. Now, the experienced cat wrangler will be able to tell you that this is a trap. I knew it was a trap. She knew it was a trap. She knew that I knew that it was a trap, and yet I was always unable to resist the urge to was that deliciously furry belly with predictable results. She would playfully try and take my face off, bite me repeatedly, scratch me, and then run off purring with a job well done whilst I bled out on the sofa. And so it is with Karl Marx. Just look at that big bushy beard. Don't you just want to tickle him under his chin and tell him what a good little communist he is? Yes, he is. He's a very good little communist. He's the best little communist. Yes, he is. The problem is that Karl, much like Bella, has been responsible for an awful lot of bloodletting, albeit with fewer meowing noises and less shitting in my shoes. In 2012, Xi Jinping was made General Secretary of the Communist Party and had the most and became the most important person in China. 
Since then, he has taken China on a radically different course than his predecessors. Whilst the great architect of reform, Zheng Jiaoping, who basically created the capitalist state in China we see today, focused on a China that would be able to provide a higher standard of living for all of his people, she is much more of a traditional Marxist. So if we're going to understand Xi and China, we're going to have to understand a little bit more about Marxism and what Xi thinks Marxism tells him to do next. Now, I'm going to do this fairly superficially because the sheer volume of theories, schisms, revisionist views, retrospective ideas from the people like uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, da, 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 it'll make your head spin. And if you stare too long, it can make you feel like going out to invest in a massive factory just to watch some workers suffer. So we'll stick to the basics and accept that I'm skipping over a huge amount of detail here that you can quickly and easily cover for yourself if you have a spare, I don't know, 20 or 30 years to read Das Kapital the Communist Manifesto and the various commentaries thereon. Or if you already know your marks, then please have mercy on this poor worker for the shonky explanation I'm about to give and move on with your life. The, the Let's Notes version goes something like this. Marx was convinced that a close reading of the economic development of the world up to the 1840s when he was writing would help you to predict how the world would evolve and develop in the future. In fact, more than help, it would predict how the world would develop. You could take history and predict the future. Marx and others, more notably Frederick Engels, concluded that for the poor to be uplifted, the wealthy must be removed and, broadly speaking, all property should become shared so that all could benefit. I mean, so far, so utopian, great idea. One or two slight hitches, but we'll move on. So, they concluded that society would evolve, and evolve is the key word here, along predictable lines. The lower classes would start as agricultural peasants toiling under the yoke of a landed feudal class of overlords with a monarch at the top. This is the feudal system that we all know. This was doomed to collapse as industrialization kicked in to be replaced by factory workers, or if you like, the proletariat in Marxist speak, who were enslaved by the same kinds of overlords, but this time they had money and not just land. So they had capital and a wealthy middle class would begin to appear or bourgeoisie. This would sooner or later result in a democratic revolution wherein that bourgeoisie or middle class would take power before they too were finally overthrown, this time by the proletariat, who would take power for themselves, all would be milk and honey, the workers' paradise would be established, and everybody would be happy to lay their ambitions to one side in favour of the collective state. Hooky dokey. I mean, that's not how humans work, but let's move on. That's what they thought. So, in a nutshell, this is historical materialism, and taken together with the idea that the state needs to have a monopoly on finance for enterprises, known as state capitalism, you get a framework which is broadly summarised as the communist dialectic, or, or put it more similarly, this is, this is the communist view of economic evolution over time. You can, of course, spice this mix with lots of other things by saying, for example, that if the state wants to control all finance, then no one should make any profits, which goes nicely with the idea that no one should be above anyone else. And therefore, if you do make a profit and you use that to buy things, you're essentially the communist idea of the devil, even if what you're buying is seeds to sow for next year's family crops. Magic would bring state capitalism together with political proletarianism and somehow transform into a functioning state in which everyone was happy. I'm glossing over a vast amount of detail here in order to make this kind of vaguely interesting. It's one, frankly, of the dullest things that you can ever spend time reading. But of course, the concepts behind it have excited a lot of people over a long period of time, and there are a plethora of resources out there. I hope you kind of get the gist from that. So, Lenin and to some extent Stalin then further observed when they actually got power that the magic couldn't happen unless society had been re-engineered, which is a nice way of saying that you need to basically kill everybody who disagrees with you or has a vested interest in the magic not happening. For example, in a piece of astounding logic that I absolutely adore, post-revolutionary Russia and China claimed that their communist party represented the workers and therefore had the workers' best interests at heart. Fine. OK. So, comrade, if you join a union, that union claims to have your best interests at heart, right? So you, by joining a union, are going against the will of the workers, which we just agreed was the state. Ergo, you are now a splitter and a traitor to the revolution. Please take this blindfold and stand up over there against that wall. Lovely. <sighs> Hence, neither Soviet Russia nor communist China allow unions unless they're controlled directly by the state and not your employers, which is kind of the point of having a union in the first place, it renders the whole thing a bit redundant. The observant amongst you will note that Soviet Russia never made it beyond state capitalism, and neither yet has China. The magic has not occurred, although Xi is quite convinced that it'll happen at any second now. Like a lot of creatures that are around in the 1950s, communist countries are now an endangered species. There's Cuba, Laos, North Korea, Vietnam, and China. 
Of those, China and Vietnam are notable because they've both decided to embrace a form of free market economy. And I say a form of quite deliberately. We'll come back to that in a second. But the point here is that they've allowed their working classes and peasant farmers to accumulate private wealth through selling excess produce. And a prosperous middle class has emerged linked to things like manufacturing. Um, they have a standard of living which is considerably better than it was, say, 20 years ago, and is roughly, certainly in the cities, comparable with the West. This means that if you're being observant, you may notice that cities like Shanghai and Beijing and others don't really look like one's typical vision of a communist country's big cities. You have shiny office blocks, a streets filled with modern vehicles, advertising everywhere, uh, many, many electric lights. In other words, it looks like the very model of a free market economy, but there's a lot going on below the waterline in terms of ideology and approach. Deng's great idea, great idea was to ensure that the market would be tempered by the state owning something like 60% of all capital for all enterprises. So that means that the state owns roughly 60% of the entire economy directly. That gives them an overwhelming level of control over industry because you either work for the government or you're working directly with somebody that works for the government. And you're completely reliant on the government for every decision and every permission. Aside from the obvious and utterly insane level of leverage and control such a system gives the CCP in day-to-day -day life for everyone, the ideological rationale here is that China needs to complete the revolution. No middle class means no overthrow by the proletariat, which means no workers' paradise. Simple. All this free market stuff is actually an illusion, and it's perfectly in line with Marxist thinking, apparently. I I'm going to pause there, and I'm going to go and have a very large whiskey whilst I try and follow that logic through and ignore the gaping holes in it, like where the fuck does a democratic revolution fit in modern-day China? Making no friends and influencing people. The key thing to remember about all of this is that the Chinese Communist Party controls basically everything, from industry to individual lives, as we've just seen. It's a self-fulfilling dynamo which will always act in its own best interests. It's also riding a tiger. It's acutely aware that corruption and incompetence in its own ranks have tarnished its credibility, and the long history of violence that, and death that went with Mao cannot be completely hidden or forgotten. It's also aware that, as the population has increased its contacts with the West, and as education standards have got higher, there is a chance of infection with ideas about things like democracy. And that's resulted in China becoming considerably less free over the last 10 years, whereas it had been over the previous 20, broadly speaking, taking the shackles off individual interest. Lenin would purr like a cat when looking at the tools that the CCP has developed to control the population. Something like 10 million people are directly or indirectly held in its penal system at any one time. It operates a number of coercive systems, for example, residential surveillance at a de designated location, what the West calls house arrest. And this often leads to disappearance, followed by faked social media messages, followed by messages that are recorded under extreme duress, including torture, and then probably a lengthy prison sentence, which may or may not be announced at a trial that the family may or may not have been informed about. If you're a member of the Communist Party and someone doesn't like you, there's a chance you'll wind up in the Liu detention system. And this sits outside of the standard Ministry of Justice court system. And it can be used to detain people indefinitely on, quotes, corruption charges. I mean, basically, as everybody has taken or given a bribe at some point, no one is safe. And everybody knows that everybody else has taken or given a bribe at some point and knows that they're not safe. This is a truly Kafkaesque tool of state imposition. If neither of those things work, then there's always the old favourite from the Soviet era, simply declaring somebody who's be who disagrees with the state to be mentally unstable and dispatching them to a psychiatric hospital for, quotes, treatment. I mean, obviously, this includes indefinite detention, denial of contact with friends and family, and of course, media, and can involve torture, but it has the spice of forced medication, food deprivation, and live human experimentation. And if all of that fails, you may well find yourself in one of the unknown thousands that China is executing every year. And I say unknown because the precise number of people killed by China is very opaque. It is thought that they kill more than the United States, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Egypt, Yemen, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Vietnam and Indonesia combined every year. They appear to employ a number of execution vans where victims are taken directly from the courtroom to be executed and their body dealt with. Apparently, this is to avoid expensive delays and the costs of facilities for death row prisoners, but it may actually be more closely related to the need to get their organs into the transplant loop quickly. That's right, China has used executed prisoners as an easy source of donated organs since the 1970s, which is really fucking lovely. It's even more lovely when you hear that it's thought that some executions have been deliberately mishandled to ensure that prisoners were alive when their organs were removed. 
This then is the regime that President Xi Jinping oversees. What the fuck, Winnie? Worst cultist since Waco. And Xi is definitely, well, let's call him a unique figure. There have only been five men to sit in his position of power since 1949. In 2018, Xi removed the two-term limit on party leaders from the Communist Party constitution. And in October 2022, at the 20th National People's Congress, he was confirmed as General Secretary for an unprecedented third term, as we saw in the first video in this series. This bodes less than well for the future, and should someone come along with a, let's say, less than a firm grip on sanity, like a, a Mao or a Stalin or, God forbid, a Trump, then the people and the party are as fucked as a teenager's pillow. He has absolutely no detectable sense of humour and famously banned Winnie the Pooh cartoons inside of China because somebody pointed out that he might look a bit like Winnie and it became a meme on the internet. Way to make yourself a beloved fucking leader. After the recent Chinese spy balloon incident in the United States when F-22 Raptors shot it down, they released this patch, which I think is fucking hilarious. Presumably to back up his credentials as definitely not Winnie the Pooh, he had his predecessor, Hu Xintao, removed from the National Congress Hall right in front of the cameras in 2022. Hu has since only been seen in public once and appeared to be being escorted by a security official. It's very unclear whether or not he's under house arrest. His fate is, like so many others in China, simply unknown. Although she clearly has visions of himself as some towering figure in Chinese history alongside Chairman Mao, unfortunately for Xi, he has all the charisma of a cold bowl of congee, and he's having to work incredibly hard to build a cult of personality. You can put your face on big billboards all you want, but you've got to have some ideas that move people's hearts if you're really going to hit the high notes as a dictator. Stalin did that by shooting people and instilling fear in them. Hitler did that by scapegoating people and glorifying war, and Mao did it by promoting the revolution as a means to remodel the entire world and remove social norms. She is, I mean, basically, he really, really likes historical materialism. Like Mao, who famously published his little red book, or more properly, quotations of Chairman Mao Zedong, Chairman Xi has his own charisma-free pop book, uh, publishing a book called Thought on Socialism with Chinese Characteristics for a New Era. No, I'm not missing the S out there. That is what it's called. It's known as Thought. And what a rollicking read it is too. So far, members of the Paris Commune or protesters on the streets of the West haven't quite got to the point where they're waving this around and quoting the 14 principles, but I'm sure it's just a matter of time. If you want to see what those 14 principles are, by the way, I've put a link in the description for the video. Unfortunately, if you want to become a civil servant in China, you're obliged to learn all 14 principles and be able to apply them to your job. Primary school children are now taught thought as a part of their curriculum, and there are more than a dozen universities that have research departments dedicated to thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. And I imagine members of the state security services simply put copies of it on loop to torture suspects. I was amused to hear that there are people that are selling apps to fast food forward through all the thoughts on any electronic or training courses so you can actually get to the bits you need to, you know, learn and be able to do for your job. Xi's image is being used everywhere, especially on TV and within the Chinese internet. Publication in major Chinese think tanks and articles in newspapers carry references to Xi's thought or wisdoms of Xi to denote that they are now official policy. Xi's history, as we've seen in past episodes, is now something of a subject to myth-making and tourism. And yet, all of this to the outside world, at least, kind of smacks of desperation. It's like, it's like watching a horny teenager in a club desperately trying to be cool enough to attract the attention of prospective partners. There's a, there's a lot of posing, a, a cloud of Lynx Africa, and not a few giggles and titters at their gangly and awkward dancing. I mean, if you want an example of this, you need to look no further than Xi's response to COVID. Initially, he denied that anything was wrong. Then he went into hiding. Then he reappeared. Then he had the doctor who broke the news to the world arrested. Then weirdly, that doctor died. Then he shut the whole country down. Then he brought it. Uh, then he brought in some more draconian methods to control every aspect of everybody's lives. But then the moment that people protested, he simply reversed course and made the whole situation worse by suddenly releasing lockdown everywhere. He's slightly out of control the whole time. The problem is that Xi really has an apparent aversion to change and unpredictable outcomes. Mao went, fuck it, and tore the rule book up and lots of people died. Xi is going back towards Marxist dialectics and old Communist Party thinking, and he's essentially dumped Deng's common prosperity agenda, meaning he isn't interested in making his people better off if it means compromising CCP or party control. He's trying to push China towards having fewer trade connections with the outside world. But China is connected. About a third of everybody, that's the entire world economy, 
connects to or from China. And so whilst it's trying to cut its own path and not rely on the evil West, and of course, maybe that's got something to do with his desire to invade Taiwan that we'll talk about a little bit later on, he is essentially in a very tricky place. As things stand, China would be hurt far more by sanctions than, say, Russia was because of that integration. And it's been the root of China's massive growth and general popularity of the CCP for the last 25 years. Well, do you know what? I think that's probably enough torture and theory and thought for one episode. I'm off to try and unlearn as much of that as I possibly can by applying as much Biojo as I can to my liver. And if I survive, the next time we'll be looking at economic and military power of China today. And crucially, and fucking finally, we'll get to what I think it actually all means for you and me.